Well, I'm absolutely delighted to be joining you here today. I, it, it is a pleasure to be part of the Global uh, Game Changers. And, uh, and so what I'm gonna be talking about today is I'm gonna spend some time talking about the financial value of a brand. And that's an area that I spend a considerable amount of my time uh, working on. So let me jump right into it and think about a brand and why companies invest in it. But we're very used to brands. We see them all the time. And, they, and we see it certainly in apparel and we see it with, in, in, in tech. It's very common. We see it with all sorts of products and brands are just part of our everyday life. And I guess the question is, why do companies invest in brand development? And the answer is not that they invest just for their own ego. That, that isn't part of it. Um, it, it. It may be a part of it, but it's not the reality. And so let's think about why a company invests in it. And I'm going to take you back to just thinking about a demand curve. That is this curve that we have in, on your first day of an economics course, which says that as you lower price, as we go from uh, up on this scale, as we lower, lower price, it turns out that our, the quantity is demanded. And at any particular point, we could see where that price and quantity uh, evolve. But when you develop a brand, what you're trying to do is you're trying to push that demand curve outward. And as you push it outward, what ends up happening is that you can start charging a higher price for the same overall volume that you've got. So you could think about, I've created a brand, I could charge a premium price. And actually, when I talk to companies and I say, what's the value of your brand? Often they say, well, I'm able to charge so much more or such a percentage more than any of my competitors. And so they think about that area that's right there. But that's only part of the equation because often what happens as we develop a brand is what we're doing is we're pushing the quantity out that we're able to sell as well. So that there is this other area of additional demand that is generated. So when I think about the value of a brand, I actually think of the combination of both of those areas. And some companies, primarily in luxury goods, take it almost exclusively in price. And some companies such as Walmart or other mass merchandisers take it primarily in terms of quantity. But most companies take some in price and some in terms of quantity. But as you develop your brand, part of what it is that you're doing is just shifting that demand curve outward so that you can capture both of these particular areas. And so when I think about the, the value, the financial value of a firm, that's what it is that I'm thinking of. I love this particular example that I'm gonna talk about right now, which what you see in the logo in, in the bottom right are, are, are the brand images that we have. It's the trademark for Bentley and Rolls-Royce. And the Rolls-Royce company was acquired by Volkswagen. And what they did is they bought the plant, they bought the equipment uh, and, and all the, the inventory that existed, and they actually bought the intellectual property. But oddly, what they didn't know when they bought Rolls-Royce is that the brand name was held separately. So they got everything of the company except for the use of the brand name and the trademark itself. And as you can see in the bottom left of this slide, BMW jumped in and BMW bought the Rolls-Royce name. The only thing they got was the Rolls-Royce, the, the use of the Rolls-Royce name and the hood ornament. And most people would contend by the way, that the, the better purchase was the purchase that was made by BMW. And BMW, by the way, they only paid $60 million for getting the Rolls-Royce brand name. And what it is that we see is BMW is now producing a car 
that they call a Rolls Royce. One of the questions that we could ask is when BMW now produces their Rolls Royce, what should it look like? And the answer to that question is if they're going to fully capitalize on that Rolls Royce brand name, the car needs to look like Rolls Royce. It needs to look like a high end luxury car. And that would be consistent with what it is uh, that that brand represented for people. And I just use the expression being consistent because for a brand name to be significant, it must be significant. It, it must be highly consistent. And that's part of what it is that's really critical here. Can we measure a brand's value or brand's equity? And actually my answer to that question is absolutely we can do it and we should. We don't wanna leave money on the table and it's also by measuring it, we're measuring the brand's overall health. We're sort of measuring how far we've moved that uh, demand curve outward. And it is commonly done with a technique known as conjoint measurement, or it could be done with experimentation. And I'll just mention a couple examples. One is McDonald's. Um, everybody is familiar with McDonald's. And if you look at McDonald's, everything is McDonald's. There's McShakes, McFries. There's a whole bunch of things. They don't necessarily have the muck part to the name, but everything is McDonald's, with the exception, actually, of Coca-Cola. And why is it that McDonald's uses the Coca-Cola brand rather than buying cola syrup and selling it as a McCola? And the answer is because they went out and they measured and they measured how much more are people willing to pay for a quarter pounder order of fries and a Coca-Cola versus a quarter pounder order of fries and a muck cola. And they, they measured what that particular value is. They went back to purchasing and said, is it worth it to us to charge people that extra or can we buy the cola syrup and acquire that at a lower overall cost to us that we make more money selling them a cola? And the answer is they make more money selling Coca-Cola rather than Mutt Cola. And they're willing to pay the Coca-Cola company extra to be able to use the Coca-Cola brand name. It's just that simple, but they went out and measured it. The second example that I'm going to mention is a company that you're all familiar with, which is Nike, they went to W.L. Gore. And W.L. Gore, you may not be familiar with until I mention the name Gore-Tex. So W.L. Gore has a variety of products, one of which is Gore-Tex. And Nike came to W.L. Gore and they said, could you make an outer lining for a shoe that is waterproof and breathable? And W.L. Gore says, that's what we do. And by the way, W.L. Gore has a variety of other products, but they definitely make Gore-Tex, which happens to be waterproof and breathable. Nike said, great, go ahead and, and, and here's the shoe. Go ahead and make the outer lining for it. We're going to test it and make sure that it's waterproof and breathable. W.L. Gore works on it for a while, delivers that to Nike. Nike tested it and said, this is perfect. It is exactly what it is that we wanted. Waterproof, breathable. However, you put the Gore-Tex hang tag on the shoe and we don't put anybody else's name on our shoe. And W.L. Gore said, we don't sell our Gore-Tex without using the hang tag. And it looked like this deal was going to fall apart. What ended up happening is together, they measured how much more were people willing to pay for a outdoor running shoe that was waterproof breathable and had the Gore-Tex hang tag on it versus one that was an outdoor running shoe, waterproof breathable, but did not have the hang tag. And the answer is people were willing to pay significantly more when it had that hang tag that said Gore-Tex. Once again, Nike looks at it and said, 
is this something that we should be doing? We could charge how much more? And I can't tell you what that specific number is. They don't want me to tell you that. But it was sufficient to convince Nike that they should sell a Nike shoe with somebody else's name on it as well. That is Gore-Tex. Now, what you note is they don't have Nike shoes with eyelets by and insole by and laces by. They don't do that because those other names don't generate enough sufficient incremental revenue. But the Gore-Tex name was worth it. They measured it and they said they're going to try and capitalize on it. My point is we could easily go out and measure what the value of a brand is and how it increases sales in terms of price as well as in terms of volume. And it's something that we should be regularly doing. One of the companies that always goes out every year and measures the value of a brand is Interbrand. Interbrand is a British company. Every year they publish the top 100 brands. They also publish it for a lot of countries and say, here are the best brands in your particular country. But this is globally what it is they're showing. And they have the top 100. I'm, I only have here for us the top 25. And what you can see is they have determined that the Apple name in 2021 is worth $408 billion, billion dollars, just the name. That is how much more they can charge because it says Apple and how much more volume it is that they end up generating as well. And the plus 26 that you see in that upper left-hand corner is how much it grew from 2020 to 2021. And you can look through the rest of the list and you can see you know, Amazon, Microsoft, Google, Samsung, you get to see a variety of, of different uh, brands that are there. And you might think that brands are really important when we're talking about consumer goods, but notice numbers 16, 17, 18, 20, 21. These are all B2B products. And they have brands that are of value as well. What I will also point out as we look at it is the Intel brand is actually on the decline. IBM also on, dec on decline. At one point, based on the inner brand data, Intel, excuse me, IBM used to be in the top three. And yet it has been steadily falling uh, year over year for the last few years. SAP, a German company that um, primarily software happens to be there in, in, the, in the top 20. And we can even look at number 24 and we can see, you know, financial services are, are in here as well. So brands are important across a variety of different product categories. I see Disney up there at, at number 10. So you basically get to see a whole array of various different products and measuring what that particular brand value is. And so we, we do see some of that. Where does a brand and its value come from? And I refer to it as brand equity, but where does it, it come from? And think about the cost of building a brand. Most of you think, well, a, a brand gets its value from advertising. And I'm going to say that's not totally true. I think first and foremost, it comes from a consistent experience. So it's what people experience from the product that gives that association with that particular name, but it must be consistent. And it also comes from other people's experience. So other people share, boy, I just bought this car, a great experience, or I just you know, I, I see someone wearing particular clothes. I, see, I hear of people using a particular service and I learn from that. So there is that viral aspect that really contributes to a brand's value. But let's be clear, a brand gets its value from what it is that it delivers to customers. And that's part of where it, it comes from. Then of course, advertising plays a role. Where we distribute, clearly plays some particular role. The pricing, which is sort of is interesting because it's recursive in many ways. 
That is, if I have a great brand, I can charge a higher price. It also is the case that as I charge a higher price, there is the association that people have that this must be a great brand. And so there's some of that that goes in, in both directions on that. And of course, the product itself, the service, the packaging all play some particular role. So I put here, you know, the package of Perrier that is there and the logo, the color, you know, and, and think about how each of these things contribute to the overall image that people have and the association that they have. I just put the Mercedes logo up there for us to see, or the Nike swoosh. All of these contribute to the value of a brand, um, even the color that's there. So my conclusion is the brand is a potentially very valuable asset. Most estimates are that the brand represents about 20% of an overall corporation's value. It should be regularly measured and managed and that we have many tools that affect the value of the brand. It's not always best to extend the same brand downward. We, we can look at it and say, you know, I, I can take a brand and I could use that name and repeatedly use it, extending it from one category to another or extending it downward. As I extend downward, it could have a negative impact on the brand. As I extend it upward, it can have a positive impact on the brand. But most importantly, the brand is an important asset. You need to protect your brand as it's a major part of the business. That's it for right now. I hope this has been of value to you. And thank you very much for including me in this program. Thank you.